Hi everyone. So today I'm going to discuss the nutrition transition, the demographic transition, the epidemiological transition, a little bit about processed foods, and a little bit about the double burden of disease. So Barry Popkin developed the concept of the nutrition transition. It's the study of the dynamic shifts in dietary intake and physical activity patterns and trends in obesity and other nutrition-related non-communicable diseases. So his research program focuses globally on understanding the shifts and stages of the transition and programs and policies to improve the population health linked with this transition. So the nutrition transition is this model that's used to describe the shifts in diets, physical activity, and causes of disease that accompany these changes in economic uh, development, lifestyle, urbanization, and demography. It is most commonly is used to refer to the change from a traditional diet towards a Western diet, also called the standard American diet, which is rich in fats, sugars, meats, and highly processed foods, and low in fiber, and accompanied by a rise in sedentary lifestyle. So before we kind of delve a little more into this nutrition transition, there's a few other definitions that will help us kind of understand these things a little better. So the demographic transition is this model that's used to describe the shifts from high fertility and high mortality to one of low fertility and low mortality. So I'll briefly kind of walk you through these uh, five stages here. So stage one of the demographic transition model is characterized by low population growth rate due to a high birth rate and high death rate. In this stage, the total population is in flux as a result of these variables dynamic patterns, neither being consistent from year to year. Because the birth rate and death rate are relatively equal to one another, there's little change in the total population. And today there's no country that is classified as stage one. Stage two of the demographic transition is characterized by a rapid decrease in a country's death rate while the birth rate remains high. As such, the total population of the country in stage two will rise because births outnumber deaths, not because the birth rate is rising. And that's important to note. So the decrease in death rate is commonly attributed to significant improvements in overall health, specifically access to pediatric care, which affects the life expectancy of most at-risk demographic groups, which are children. But along with the basic health care, an expanded education system, gender equality, and technological advances in the areas of food production and sanitation, also work to decrease the death rates. There are a number of countries that remain in stage two and uh, for various social and economic reasons, including uh, much of Sub-Saharan Africa, Guatemala, Palestine, Yemen, and Afghanistan. In stage three of the demographic transition model, death rates are low and birth rates decrease, usually as a result of improved economic conditions, an increase in women's status and education, and access to contraceptives, or contraceptions, I should say. So example of stage three countries are Botswana, Colombia, India, Jamaica, Kenya, Mexico, South Africa, and the United Arab Emirates. Stage four of the demographic transition model is viewed as kind of this ideal placement of a country because total population growth is very gradual. And examples of this country of stage four um, are Argentina, Australia, Canada, Brazil, most of maybe Europe, Singapore, South Korea, and the United States. Stage five is a country that experiences loss to the overall population. And this is kind of stage five is more of a, of a theory as opposed to something that's kind of necessarily in action in place that we're seeing. And it's, as I said, an experience is loss in the overall population as the death rates become higher than birth rates. So in this scenario, it is the economy that is the driving force behind further limits on family size and the use of contraception. So whether they're persuaded by the high cost of raising a family in cities or the enticing opportunities of employment to delay childbearing, birth rates decline well below the replacement level of 2.1 children per woman. And we can see some of this already happening where 
women are opting to go to school, get education, get a career, so they're delaying having children, which therefore usually results in having fewer children, and also the cost of raising children. We can see that, especially in places on the east and west coast. So in recent years, a few countries, primarily in eastern and southern uh, Europe, have reached a negative rate of natural increase as their death rates are higher than their birth rates. So possible examples of stage five are Croatia, Estonia, Germany, Greece, Japan is a good one, Portugal. And so according to this demographic transition model, each of these countries should have a negative population growth, but this has not necessarily been the case um, due to uh, immigration. So immigration is, is keeping that. So for example, uh, the United States would technically, I think, be below the replacement level of 2.1, but since we have uh, immigration, it remains above that. Or population, I shouldn't say above that, but population is, is increasing. So the epidemiological transition describes changing pattern of population age distribution, mortality, fertility, life expectancy, and causes of death. And so causes of death shift from high prevalence of infectious diseases as a result of malnutrition, poor sanitation, to a pattern of high prevalence of chronic and degenerative diseases that are associated with urban industrial lifestyles. And we're experiencing that in the United States for sure. So what is a processed food? And so processed food is simply one that's been altered from its original form. And so the International Food Information Council defines processing as any deliberate change in a food that occurs before it is ready for us to eat. So heating, pasteurizing, canning, and drying all are considered forms of processing, but basic preparation and prevention techniques currently don't turn kind of wholesome foods like frozen vegetables and grains into junk. And just because something has gone through a process doesn't mean it's unhealthy to eat. Ultra processed foods are probably what many of us already think of as simply as, as processed foods. And those are those shiny packaged, nothing to do with nature products found in fast food restaurants and gas stations, uh, mini marks. So these are the definitions of kind of minimally processed foods and processed foods which are made by adding fats, oils, sugars, and salts. Ultra-processed foods are kind of not modified foods, but formulations of industrial ingredients and other substances derived from foods, plus additives. Sounds yummy. Um, and so examples of that are soft drinks, chips, chocolate, candy, ice cream, sweetened breakfast cereals, packaged soups, chicken nuggets, hot dogs. I mean, the list goes on and on. So. These are what uh, we consider processed foods. So back to this nutrition transition. And so researchers have divided the nutrition transition into these uh, five patterns. Um, so we have pattern one, which is the hunter and gatherer. Pattern two, early agriculture. Pattern three, end of famine. Pattern four, overeating, obesity-related diseases, and pattern five, kind of these uh, behavior changes. So rapid socioeconomic, demographic, and technological changes are often linked with the increased in globalization, are kind of explained as a vast array of shifts in our way of living and doing commerce. And so these shifts have led to an ever-increasing rate of change of dietary activity, body composition, and non-communicable disease patterns around the world. And this pace of dietary and physical activity changes has accelerated to varying degrees in different regions of, of the world. And so over the past three centuries, the pace of dietary and activity change has appears to have accelerated in varying degrees in different regions of the world, as we can imagine. Moreover, this dietary and active changes parallel major changes in health status as well as major demographic and socioeconomic changes. So obesity emerged early in these shifts, as does the age and level of morbidity and mortality. 
So we can think of five broad nutritional patterns, and they are not restricted to a particular time period. We can look at hunters and gatherers, so we're not necessarily restricting ourselves to that. It's just for convenience, these patterns are outlined as historical conditions or events. Early patterns are not restricted to periods in which they first arose, but they kind of continue to characterize certain geographic and socioeconomic subpopulations. So currently, most low and middle income countries are rapidly moving from pattern three, which is kind of the end of famine, to pattern four, which is consuming more energy dense diets. So this shift from traditional diets to a Western diet has been a key contributor to obesity epidemics in low to middle income countries. They also, as they're shifting too, they become more sedentary due to changes in the type of work they're in need. They're not working in fields, maybe they're working in factories, maybe they're working in offices. So they're expending less calories as they are now eating more dense, energy dense food. So the shift from recent famine, kind of pattern three, to one dominated by this nutritionally uh, related non-communicable diseases has been very rapid in most, as I said, low to middle income economies. Moreover, there's evidence of speeding up of this transition in high income, more economically developed countries. You know, we can see this uh, as China. China is becoming uh, more economically developed and their obesity rates are, are rising quite rapidly as they're leaving behind traditional diets more activity to more of the uh, Western diet. So pattern five is behavioral change in this diagram here. As a new dietary pattern it appears to be emerging kind of as a result of changes in diet, evidently associated with the desire to prevent or delay degenerate diseases and prolong health. I'm a big fan of doing that. Whether these changes instituted in some countries by either kind of consumer and others also kind of prodded by government policy will constitute a large scale transition in dietary structure and body composition kind of remains to be seen. So what this is kind of saying is our, our, our consumers, you and I, are we going to say, hey, we've had enough of this. We don't want this kind of food anymore. We don't want to subsidize certain industries. We want better quality food. Or is it not going to necessarily come from us? and say, hey, government needs to come in, government needs to regulate these foods, either tax them, eliminate them, something kind of along those lines. And that is kind of yet to be seen. Um, government has played a larger role in some of these European countries uh, than it has in the United States. Here in the United States, some of the things might be uh, limiting the size of the big gulp that can be served increasing taxes, for example, on soda or um, cigarettes, those are kind of things. So, um, the, I guess the, uh, the question is, is, is why do we care about this? Why do we care about these, this demographic transition, the stages of nutrition transition? Why do we care about this? Uh, well, due to lack of physical activity and more ultra-processed foods, the rate of these non-communicable diseases is growing rapidly, and this causes a significant social and economic uh, problem on, you know, the, whether it's that the globally or if it's at the personal level or the state level, it causes significant issues, and so these are are rising and becoming more and more a problem. So here we have uh, the stages of the health, nutrition, and demographic change. So basically we're looking at all three of what we just talked about in one diagram. So if we look at the demographic transition, we just as we talked about, high fertility, uh, mortality, and as we're kind of going down, down, down. So now we're focusing on healthy aging and spatial redistribution, the epidemiological transition, high prevalence of infectious diseases, so in some countries, you're more likely to die of uh, poor sanitation, um, uh, malaria, things like that. But then we're moving in the epidemiological transition, so we're getting more into chronic diseases that are prominent. And then nutrition transition. 
um, as we kind of move through that, which we just talked about. So that kind of brings up this idea that is happening now is this double burden of disease. And so low and middle income countries are currently facing an epidemiological transition due to globalization, urbanization, and changes in the economic, social, and demographic profiles. So while maternal and child health challenges and communicable diseases still impact them, they face increasing in the prevalence of uh, mortality related and non communicable diseases, which lead to this double burden of disease. And so, what it's saying is that in some of these uh, developing countries, not only are they having to deal with communicable diseases because their economies are changing, their lifestyles are changing, they now have to deal with non communicable diseases. So, they kind of are having kind of they're getting the short end of both sticks, I guess, um, on dealing with that where places like the United States, we don't have to deal so much with um, communicable diseases. I mean, we still do, but not to the extent of some place like Sub-Saharan Africa. We need to deal more with non-communicable diseases. So we have less of this double burden of disease. So on that note, have a great day.